This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Hi, folks. Before we start the show, I want to ask for your help. If you enjoy Kick-Ass Politics, I hope you'll help us reach our goal of raising our full production budget for 2016 by donating on our website at kickasspolitics.com or at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Thanks for listening, and now enjoy the show. I would build a great wall, and nobody builds walls better than me, believe me. Nobody would be tougher on ISIS than Donald Trump. I will be the greatest jobs president that God ever created. You know, I have very high aptitude. I'm really rich. I'll show you that in a second. I'm like the most popular person that's ever lived. And by the way, you know, I always say what a good, you know, like I was really smart. I'm very handsome. (laughs) That's the only thing I can think of right now. No one is more obsessed with Donald Trump than Donald Trump. Actually, you know what? I take that back. For as was John Hinckley Jr. to an 18-year-old still straight Jodie Foster, so too is the American media's love affair with Donald J. Trump. They follow him around everywhere, carrying his books to school, hanging on his every word, that word usually being one of a handful of his favorite over-the-top superlatives, like amazing, big, beautiful, or hugely classy generally used to describe himself, but occasionally used to describe inanimate objects like, say, a wall or Melania. And the media? They eat up every awkwardly worded adjective. But just like real love, the media has different types of love for Donald Trump. You have the unconditional love of conservative news outlets like Drudge Report and Breitbart.com, for whom Trump can do no wrong even when his campaign manager roughs up their own reporter. These guys aren't just in the tank for Trump. They are completely submerged above the head in a Houdini water torture cell of Trump idolatry. Remember Baghdad Bob, Saddam Hussein's propaganda minister? They're a little like that. Hear me out. In Breitbart Drudge World, stuff like inciting violence or degrading women or having a weird relationship with the KKK just isn't considered newsworthy. All you need to know is every conceivably bad rumor about Donald Trump's rivals and that Donald Trump magically makes walls appear, national debts vanish, and he walks on water. Then you have the conservative influencers on Fox News and talk radio like Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, and even Rush Limbaugh, who have more of a battered housewife kind of love for Donald Trump. Okay, it's not so much a love as a pathological fear of Donald Trump, really. But by their rationale, losing your integrity, and maybe even your soul, is the lesser of two evils when compared to alienating a portion of your audience, or even worse, provoking an angry, irrational, retaliatory Twitter tantrum from the Donald himself. Finally, you have the weird infatuation type of love that the mainstream media has for their favorite reality star slash ratings getter. They don't like Trump. Some of them may even hate him. They see him for the charlatan he is, but like any local news channel that never met a car chase they didn't like, they just can't help themselves. And frankly, they're lazy. I mean, why actually waste time and money producing quality journalism when all you get out of the deal is an Edward R. Murrow Award? Why not put the network on autopilot, air all Trump all the time, and coast your way to Nielsen's heaven? Then, of course, there's my guest today, who has zero love for Donald Trump, But he is a little bit obsessed, more like determined, to talk about Donald Trump and expose him for who he really is until such time as the Trump train comes to a screeching halt. Jacob Weisberg is the chairman and editor-in-chief of the Slate Group, which consists of their flagship news site, Slate.com, as well as Slate Video and ForeignPolicy.com. And when he's not running the Slate Empire, He's a political commentator for NPR, a columnist for Newsweek, and a best-selling author. On top of all that, he's now the host of a new semi-daily podcast called Trumpcast, and he's vowed to continue producing Trumpcast until the whole long Trump nightmare comes to an end at this summer's GOP convention, or next November, and in his words, hopefully not in 2020, or God forbid, 2024. 
Today, Jacob Weisberg and I will talk about how the whole Trump phenomenon happened in the first place, the prospect of a brokered GOP convention, and Trump's chances in the general election. He'll reveal what a psychologist had to say about Donald Trump, what it is that Trump voters are so angry about, and why comparing Trump to Hitler is ridiculous. But comparing Trump to Mussolini? Maybe not so far off the mark. Plus, getting trolled by Trumpanistas on social media and Jacob's review of Trump wine. Coming up with Jacob Weisberg, editor-in-chief of the Slate Group, in just a moment. Hollywood to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. I'm joined over the phone by Jacob Weisberg. He's the editor-in-chief of the Slate Group, and he has a new podcast called Trumpcast. Jacob, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me on, Ben. You know, Ben, we have a Ben Mathis Lilly at Slate. You aren't any relation to him, are you? You know, I'm not, but I actually I had your guy Mike Pesca on a few months ago, and when he posted that episode on Twitter, Ben Mathis, Lily, and I kind of got in a Twitter battle <laughs> over who has the right to the name, and my argument was anyone who's the real Ben Mathis wouldn't have to hyphenate the name. So <laughs> Yeah, fair point. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, what was your motivation behind you launching Trumpcast? Is this your way of trying to make sense of what's going on? Is it satire, therapy? Uh, well, a little bit all of the above, but I think making sense is the highest priority. I mean, I, I, I view Trump's ending nomination, although actually it's looking a little less certain than it seemed to be even a week ago. Uh, but as a, as a kind of national political crisis, you know, I've been writing about politics, covering politics uh, since I was 20 years old. And I've never seen anything like this kind of threat to American values and American democracy. I think Trump is, a, is, is an authoritarian figure. I think he's someone more akin to the kinds of uh, uh, authoritarian leaders we've seen emerge in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in Turkey. And I, I just regard it as a kind of crisis. And I guess I, I thought in general people were insufficiently alarmed about it. And so I wanted to do a show that would sort of sound the alarm, but at the same time ask in a serious way how could this be happening in, in our country? I think so many of us who follow politics were, were just taken by surprise. We didn't think this could happen, and it's happening. So I think it's incumbent to try on us to try to understand and go deeper and explain it. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring up the authoritarian thing, because I've always hated it when people compare anyone to Hitler. You know, whether it was the left saying that about Bush or the right drawing Hitler mustaches on President Obama's picture— that always irritated me because it's really they were nothing like, you know, no one was carting people off to the gas chambers and all that. But this is the first time when I actually start to think, you know, there are comparisons. Yeah. And I guess I would say, you know, I think there are there is Trump really does have a lot of fascist instincts. That doesn't mean he, he he's Hitler. You know, Hitler was only one kind of fascist. Uh, Mussolini was another. Franco was another. There have been variants in Latin America on fascism well in the 60s. You know, there are a lot of flavors of authoritarianism. I went back and read, you know, the novel It Can't Happen Here? Well, it's, it's Sinclair Lewis who won the Nobel Prize, oh, wrote right. this novel in, in 1935 called It Can't Happen Here. And it's basically, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a dystopian novel that uh, forecasts the rise of fascism in America at a time when fascism was on the rise in Europe. And it's actually not a great novel, although it's something people cite a lot because the title is sort of so catchy. You know, this idea that people said, oh, well, America's immune to fascism. And the point of the novel was it wasn't. Yeah. But the, the, the fascist, American fascist leader, Sinclair Lewis, imagine, you know, was a lot more like Huey Long. And an interesting plot point in the book hmm. is this guy who was the, the fascist president of the United States he is opposed to Hitler and opposed to Mussolini. You know, he doesn't like those, those foreign guys. But he's he's doing something that is a recognizable variant on the same kind of kind of politics. And I think you have to ask not, you know, is Trump Hitler? Because obviously he's not, and it's sort of a 
you know, the question is sort of almost offensive in some ways. But you have to say, well, you know, if we did have fascism in contemporary America, what would it look like? And I think it would involve some of these elements like restricting the press, admiring other authoritarian leaders like Putin, um, you know, worshipping the strength and force, contempt for weakness, um, expressions of violence at, at rallies and public events. I think you have a lot of things that are hallmarks of fascism yeah, around it, Trump's movement. Yeah, and it's interesting that you brought up Huey Long because, you know, I, I've said to multiple people since this began, if you want to know what a Trump presidency is going to be like, just read all the King's men. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's right in there. And, and now that's a that's a great political novel. I mean, I I love that book, and I and I do think, you know, uh, there there are some there's some interesting analogies there. I mean, Trump. What's what's different about Trump is that he's he's pretty clearly a clinical narcissist. Narcissism is one of those terms that's kind of thrown around as sort of pop psychology yeah. a lot. I had on my show uh, a guy who was who was a, a clinical psychologist, uh, and you know says I mean. Uh, psychiatrists aren't supposed to diagnose people long distance, but he says Trump, the symptoms of narcissistic personality disorder are so clear around Trump that if you've studied this at all, positively can't ignore it. It's clear as day. And one of the one of the things about narcissistic personality disorder is it basically can't be treated because the people who have it don't right. think they're sick and won't won't seek treatment, won't accept treatment. And yeah, I mean, you don't need a PhD to see that he's clearly emotionally disturbed. Would it be such a huge leap to go from saying uh, that he is a narcissist to saying that he might be a sociopath? Yeah, I mean, that's one of those distinctions. You know, I mean, I think um, as, as I've heard people make the distinction, a sociopath simply does not know the difference between right and wrong, um, where, you know, a narcissist is, is driven by distorted view of themselves in relation to the world. So, you know, sociopaths, I mean, being a sociopath is much more extreme and much more severe. And I'd, I'd probably argue against Trump being a sociopath. You know, when you hear other people okay. in his family talk, uh, you know, he doesn't actually seem like he was necessarily a terrible parent. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that I think the, the, the guy has an illness. I think there's something wrong with him. Yeah. Um, but he's not Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, so right, I think we, right. you know, there are different like, shades of we sociopaths. have to keep some sense of perspective. Yeah, I think he would be the oldest president that we've ever had. So I almost wonder if he has that thing where as people get into old age, they start to lose their filter and say crazy, inappropriate things. There, I know that there's a clinical term for that, but let's just call it crazy old grandpa ruined Thanksgiving syndrome. <laughs> Dementia. Yeah, no, but, uh, uh, you know, he... Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you saw the story about his doctor who said he can categorically state he's the healthiest person ever to run for president. <laughs> we did a little parody of that on the show yesterday about Trump visiting the doctor and uh, what good health he's in. Um, but he does seem like he's in pretty good health, and he doesn't, to be honest to me, seem much different at 68. Is he 68? Uh, than he was when, you know, he was he was 35. He's the same guy. Yeah, you know, along the lines of the psychologist talk, you also had an episode on Trump's relationship with women. Um, is it overstating things to say that he's a misogynist? No, not at all. I mean, if, there's, if, if, there, if there is such a thing as misogyny, he is an, he's an extreme expression of it, and we see it all the time in every way. I mean, to the way he, you know, starting with the way he only relates to women in terms of their looks and their attractiveness, um, in terms of, you know, his, his really uh, extreme, extreme misogynist policy views and this idea that you would punish people, i.e. Put, put women in jail for seeking abortions, goes well beyond what the most right-wing people in the Republican Party uh, support. And I think there's just this confluence of, of, um, of success and male sexual power and political power uh, that, you know, just seems to have this sort of streak of... of Viewing women as secondary and, and second-class citizens, you know, there's, there's nothing clear, and it's it's what's starting to hurt Trump because so much of it is piled up now that yeah. you're starting to see Trump's numbers negatives have always been very high, but among women now, you know, they're they're 70 percent of women would never vote from 70 plus percent. So you know, I think that's starting to be his undoing, and if he does 
if Wisconsin next week is Waterloo, I think that's probably going to be the issue that drove it. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say that he's he's sliding with women because to hear him talk, Trump likes to tout these reports of Democrats switching parties just to vote for him in the GOP primary. And he says that he's been doing surprisingly well with women and blacks and even Hispanics. Is there any truth to this? And is that something that Democrats should worry about in the general? Well, what I think, I mean, Democrats should worry. We should all worry about Donald Trump Trump having gotten as far as he's gotten. If he gets the nomination, we should worry even more. And we should worry even if it's only a 10% chance or a 15% of his chance, chance of his winning the election, because he does represent something so unprecedented in terms of uh, American democracy and, and, and democratic values. But that said, you know, I don't, I, I think it's unlikely. He, the people, there are people who are crossing over to vote for him in open primaries. There are people who, you know, sometimes it will be referred to as uh, Reagan Democrats, white working class. Um, they, are, they are people who have been negatively affected by economic change and, and Trump's nationalist, economic nationalist message really resonates uh, with them. But what you've got to say on the other hand is that even men who fall into this category, lots and lots of them are union members, union workers. Mm. And the, you know, the unions, with the exception yeah. of the Teamsters, have, have been very solidly democratic, and unions turn out their vote. And it's just hard to imagine unions that have always voted democratic having their members come out and vote for Trump in substantial numbers. So I think he does have some appeal in that part of society and people who've been economic victims in, in, in that sense. But I don't think that makes him mean, you know, means that he becomes a, a likely winner of an election against Hillary Clinton. Well, we're going to take a quick break and then I'll have more with Jacob Weisberg, host of Trumpcast. Back in just a moment. Hey, folks, do you like reading but you don't have the time? Then maybe it's time to start listening to audiobooks. Audiobooks are the perfect thing to listen to on your drive to work or on the treadmill at the gym, or how about while you're cooking dinner or relaxing in the tub? You don't have to carve out an hour or two of your day just to focus all your attention on reading a book anymore. Because audiobooks are great just about anywhere. And right now, you can listen to an audiobook for free with a special promotion for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics for a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook download, which can be any of Audible's 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, iPad, or MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the sponsor link on our webpage at kickasspolitics.com to download the free audio book of your choice. And now, back to the show. We're back, and I'm talking with Jacob Weisberg, editor-in-chief of Slate Magazine and host of Trumpcast. So, Jacob, I'm still trying to figure out who the Trump supporters are and what it is that they want. And the only consistent explanation I keep hearing is that there's a segment of society that's angry. Everyone's really mad. And I keep asking myself, I asked Bill Kristol the other day, what is everyone so angry about? You know, it's not Vietnam. There, you know, This isn't the Great Depression. Maybe you don't like Obamacare or you don't think Republicans in Congress are doing enough, but still, overall, life's pretty good. So what is everyone so mad about? Yeah, well, um, it's funny. I mean, I, 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 a little like you, I mean, I, I would react against sort of anger as a blanket explanation of what voters are doing. Because, you know, right. some voters are always angry about, about something. Yeah. Some true. people are always angry about something. I think, you know, the, the legitimate, if you wanted to say what is le- the legitimate issue driving Trump support, it's economic stagnation for, for the working class mm. and uh, the growth of economic inequality. So while the country is in conventional terms doing pretty well economically, unemployment is down at or just under 5%, the economy's growing, uh, you know, credit's available, there are job, jobs available. If you are a non-college educated worker, 
you have over the last couple of decades not seen your standard of you've seen your standard of living increase maybe in absolute terms in that the you know the TV you can buy for three hundred dollars a lot better than TV you used to buy for three hundred dollars but in relative terms relative to people who do have more education and better life opportunities your prospects in society are going down so that's fueling an anger that I think is legitimate uh, and I think it's I think it is one of the biggest issues facing the country. But it's a complicated issue. It's an issue without easy, easy answers. And it's an issue on which the answers that Donald Trump provides are pretty clearly the wrong answers that would make things worse. But I think it's because of that economic stagnation of lower middle class working people that Trump is, is finding resonance to his economic message. Yeah, and these supporters seem to have almost a cult-like following. I mean, he said that he could shoot someone and they would still vote for him. Do you think there's anything left at this point that would make his supporters question their allegiance to him? I mean, it's funny. He, 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 we may yet come to that, him shooting somebody. Um, the, there have been several moments in the campaign where I think there was just an almost universal reaction but now he's really gone too far. You know, right. this comment, about, you know, John McCain blaming John McCain for being shot down in Vietnam, or you know, some of his comments about women, or his comments about Mexicans. When you just say nobody can say that in surviving politics, and it has no effect on him. <laughs> so, uh, or it's had very little effect on him so far. And there is this kind of base that it takes all that as you know, they, as reasons to support him. And I think part of that is uh, this. Uh, this anti-elitism that's also a big part of his appeal, yeah. where uh, a lot of his supporters really, really dislike his, the people who are against him. The media, people who are more educated, elite, coastal elite. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of class resentment at the core of his appeal, that the more people attack him, uh, the more it it bonds him him to to them, and that's a funny phenomenon, you know. But it may be that I, I think there's core base of his supporters that actually are just impervious to facts and impervious to persuasion, and there's almost nothing he could do. I mean, yeah. you know, the the KKK thing came pretty close, but maybe if you know <laughs> instead of just take? being slow to distance himself from the KKK, he actively endorsed the KKK or gave a Nazi salute. I think that might do it, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, the guy's like the Terminator. It's like nothing will kill him. You know, I used to say that at this point it would probably take him being a convicted pedophile for people to turn on him, but I don't even know if that would do it because some of the things he said about his own daughter are just downright creepy. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Well, you know, they, the old Louisiana expression is, you know, the only thing that would sort of end a political career is being caught in bed with, with a, a, a dead girl or a live boy. You know, but uh, I think uh, with Trump, I don't think that would do it, um, you know, but... Uh, yeah, he's always talking say, about how hot his well, daughter well, is. I mean, God. Yeah. It's funny, his, his daughter, you know, if you wanted to say something positive about him, I do think his daughter, other than the fact that she supports her father for president, seems pretty impressive. Um, yeah. You know, she's, she's, she's capable. She's a, she's a businesswoman. She's, you know, she's, she's involved in all sorts of things. Uh, she's clearly intelligent. Yeah, um, and uh, you know it's it's funny. I mean, the one if, if the one sort of disjunction in my totally negative view of Trump is that he seems to have have raised a, a, a daughter who's who's done you know who's who's uh, who's a solid person. Yeah, and you know I would put uh, Donald Trump Jr. in there too because when I've seen him on interviews lately, he seems to be a pretty fast study at politics, and he's actually a hell of a lot more articulate than his dad. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I haven't got a clear sense of the, the of his two sons. I don't totally know what to make make of. Donald Trump is not unintelligent, you know. I mean, I think we, you yeah. know, you, you can. I, I I violently disagree with him and object really? to him, but I do not. I've never for a minute thought that he was a dimwit. Really, because that's what perplexes me. Everyone gives him so much credit. They throw around phrases like he's a genius at marketing and he's a brilliant strategist and all this stuff. Yet I look at Trump and I'm like, here's a guy who can barely string two words together. He does not. He's not interested in politics. He doesn't know anything about it. Right. And shockingly, he doesn't doesn't want to learn anything about it. You know, just now when you would, as any any 
presidential candidate who got this far would be trying to fill in their the lack of expertise wherever it was. He just sure. couldn't care less, and he'll go into the you know Washington Post editorial board and the New York Times editorial board and just completely bluff his way through. And that's why he's coming out with these preposterous statements, like you know he wouldn't he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't force where necessarily force where the use of nuclear weapons in Europe. You know, I mean, it's yeah. just, there's things that that it. Ten minutes with a foreign policy advisor should keep him from saying. But that's not. I think that's ignorance, but it's not stupidity. If if you if you get the distinction. Well, yeah, yeah, I get that. What bothers me so much, though, is just the arrogance. Because you, you know, you had other people like Carly Fiorina. She had no experience in policy, but she hit the books and she learned things forwards and backwards. And here you have a guy who just doesn't. He's running for the highest office in the land, and he just doesn't seem to care. Yeah. I mean, a big part of what concerns me about it, you know, the reason you could argue I'm, I'm someone who's not going to vote for the Republican in any case, uh, you know, why don't I want Donald Trump, who would have the worst chance of winning, get the Republican nomination? And the answer is largely what it says about the country and what it says about the country to the rest of the world. Yeah. And we have a two-party system, and to have a representative, to have the leader of one of those two parties be a bigot, uh, be a nativist, be a racist, and and be so open in his admiration for dictatorship and systems that aren't democratic. I think just sends this message to the rest of the world that the you know that the America they they depend on as a sort of backstop of democratic values is not what they thought, and, and to some extent makes me feel that way too. And so that's you know that's why I really hope that's why I care more about who gets the Republican nomination than I think I've ever cared before. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. And you know, I've always been a very moderate Republican and I'll be honest, I don't even feel at home in my own party anymore. I, I feel that I've been completely driven out of any, whatever semblance of a rational GOP there ever was. And uh, that brings up another issue because I listened to your episode where you talked to Stuart Stevens, who was Mitt Romney's former campaign strategist and He's running an anti-Trump super PAC. He laid out all of these theoretical scenarios where Republicans could take the nomination from Trump at the convention. But the longer this goes on, I see Republicans grasping at straws and en engaging in what seems like imaginary thinking. And frankly, it, it, it seems increasingly desperate and delusional. <laughs> I mean, does anyone really think we're going to be able to take this from him at this stage in the game? I actually think there's a pretty good chance. Really? Uh, I think if he if he uh, loses Wisconsin next week, you know, he's, he'll be pointed towards going to the convention without 1,237 delegates. And there, at that point, the the convention rules and the credentials committee and all that comes into play. You know, they set new rules every convention. The rules are kind of arbitrary in a lot of ways, and there is just no precedent that says. If you go to the convention with a plurality of delegates, but not a majority, that you're entitled to it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the party, if it if it can kind of eventually get its act together, will be in a decent position first to block him, and then to coalesce around some alternative, which will probably be a losing alternative. I mean, I think it'll be a losing alternative either way. If they nominate him, I think there'll be some sort of conservative third party candidate. Stuart, Stuart Stevens was talking about that when I interviewed him. Um, and you know, if they if they deny it to Trump, probably Trump will you know run some sort of independent campaign. One way or the other, they're kind of screwed. Oh, yeah. um, but I think there's a <laughs> chance that you know if they nominate someone other than Trump, it helps to protect them in Congress and from losing important seats in the Senate and a lot of seats yeah. in the House. And I think they're going to care about that. So the party cares about that. So I think I think there's a chance they'll 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 keep it away from him. Yeah, well, you know, I'll tell you, the guy I feel sorry for is Ryan Priebus, the, the chairman of the RNC. I mean, you know, after the thumping that Republicans had in 2012, he did that whole exhaustive study and came up with this big strategy to soften the GOP brand and bring in women and Latino voters. He must be, pri in private, he must be losing his mind right now. I don't know, but, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't have much sympathy for him, Ben, because <laughs> I don't feel that he's, he's stood up to Trump. I mean, if no, those are your values, if you care about broadening the par party's va base, uh, you know, making it a party that looks more like the country, then you've got to challenge the, what Trump is saying and the values he stands for. And I don't think it's a given that the head of the party 
just has to be neutral. I think he was cowed, and I don't think he's done yeah. anything really to challenge Trump to date. You know, he's sort of, in a lot of ways, he's, he's kind of appeased Trump. Before we go, I, I have to imagine that you've had some interesting experiences with Trump supporters on social media. Well, you know, one thing that's, that's sort of funny, if you, if you go on in the uh, iTunes store, my, my show has, uh, has a ton of five-star ratings and a bunch of one-star ratings, <laughs> and, and almost none in between. So it's pretty polarized. And the one stars, of course, are coming from the Trump people who say, oh, this is biased and unfair. Uh, and yeah, I hear from them on, on social media a, a little bit. I mean, it's ugly, frankly. I, you know, some of that stuff, you know, when I, when I get people tweeting at me anti-Semitic stuff or racist yeah. stuff or, yeah. you know, birther stuff about Obama, life's too short. I mean, I block those people because I yeah. just, I don't see the value. I mean, I want to know what, what people are saying, but... Um, it's, uh, it, it's unpleasant. And, that, and that, I'm not saying all his supporters feel that way, but people who do feel that way are gravitating towards Trump rather than any other candidate. Yeah. Well, you've tried Trump wine on the show. How was that? Um, it was not good. Um, Felix Salmon, no. who knows more about wine than I do, tasted it with me. He said, well, it's like the wine you get on an airplane. I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't undrinkable, but you would sort of drink it if, uh, there are no other choices. It was a, it's a decent bottle of wine for $5, but I think it's about a $20 price point for it. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't trust wine or steak from a man who orders his meat well done, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that's for uh, sure. you know, I wish you the best of luck with Trump Cast. And, you know, I like you, Jacob, but I'm a little concerned. You know, I have this image in my mind that the longer this Trump thing drags on, you might start to take on his affectations, <laughs> start spray tanning and dyeing your hair orange. You drive Slate Group into bankruptcy and leave your wife for, I don't know, Miss Hawaiian Tropics or something. <laughs> so I can just see you gradually morphing into Donald Trump, and it's it's not a pretty picture. So stay strong, Jacob. Uh, no, yeah, no, the, the show is uh, is about the crisis, and I've, I've vowed it's going to stay on until he's he's done until we're safe from donald trump so well, you know my hope is that the show it doesn't have to be on that long but i think it's a pretty good chance we're on at least till cleveland and you know could be till november and worst case scenario who knows well jacob weisberg the podcast is called trump cast and you can get it at slate.com or on itunes jacob weisberg thanks for joining me on the show thank you ben i enjoyed it Thanks again to Jacob Weisberg for coming on the show. And if you enjoyed today's episode, I'd encourage you to check out his new podcast, Trumpcast. You can subscribe to Trumpcast on iTunes or at Slate.com. And you can follow Jacob on Twitter at at Jacob W-E. That's J-A-C-O-B-W-E. Be sure to subscribe to Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes and leave us a review while you're there. And if you really want to help us out, then donate to our GoFundMe campaign at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the donate button on our website at kickasspolitics.com. Follow us on Twitter at at kapolitics or visit kickasspolitics on Facebook. And while you're there, recommend us to your friends on your social media. As always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickasspolitics.com. On the next podcast, I'll talk with Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and national security columnist for Slate.com, Fred Kaplan, about his new book, Dark Territory, The Secret History of Cyber War. We'll talk about a strange connection between a computer pioneer, the Matthew Broderick film, War Games, and President Ronald Reagan that led to the first presidential directive on cybersecurity, and we'll discuss why it took Washington decades to take cyber threats seriously. Plus, we'll talk about how the U.S. cyber attack that shut down Iranian nuclear reactors may have set a dangerous precedent in the rules of cyber warfare. We'll get an idea of just how much damage the U.S. cyber teams can do to America's enemies, We'll weigh the cyber arms race between the U.S. and China, and we'll speculate on how the FBI was able to hack the San Bernardino shooter's iPhones. All that and more coming up with national security reporter Fred Kaplan on the next podcast. But for now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics.